The Old Testament reading for this proper 16 is from Isaiah chapter 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Romans chapters 11 and 12. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. In the movie, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Stuart Townsend plays the character of Dorian Gray from the novel, The Portrait of Dorian Gray. If you don't know the book or the movie, be forewarned, this is your spoiler alert. His portrait has a spell on it. The image of the painting of Gray ages, and but Gray himself remains the same no matter what happens to him. But if he were ever to look at that portrait of himself, the spell would be broken, and he and the painting would essentially trade places, in which case Gray himself would age rapidly and die, 
and the painting would go back to its pristine condition like it was new. In the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Gray is fighting against one of the soldiers of the notorious bad guy named M. Gray has a spray of bullets into his torso, after which he takes his sword out and kills the bad guy. But before that henchman dies, he falls forward and grabs a hold of Gray's shirt and it tears down to see those bullet wounds flying away like dust. And when the henchman sees this, he asks Gray with his last dying breath, what are you? And Gray answers, I'm complicated. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they give a few answers of what people are saying. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, or, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Lots of answers, but nobody really seems to know for sure who the Son of Man is. Everyone's talking about it, but nobody knows for certain. Well, it turns out there really is nothing new under the sun, because today is the same story. Ask five different people on any street corner in America, who is Jesus? And you'll get five different answers. You know, Pastor Hewen, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but do you, do you enjoy flying on planes? Don't mind it. I love flying on planes for one reason and one reason only, because I get a captive audience of whoever gets to sit next to me. Because how does every conversation go on a plane? First, you exchange those usual pleasantries. You gripe about the airlines and what a pain it is to get through security, but in a post-9-11 world, how necessary all this is, and on and on. And then comes my favorite question. So what do you do? And then I get to tell them, well, I'm a Lutheran pastor. I tell people about Jesus. And from that point on, the conversation can go in three different directions. First, they'll either get awkward and quiet, which is kind of hard to break into a conversation, but it does give me an opportunity to read my book. Two, they can want to talk more, which is awesome, because you can tell them more about Jesus. Or three, they're going to get defensive. All three are really just fine because there's always that opportunity to talk about who Jesus is. But the most fun is the third one, the defensive one. Because normally, not always, but normally, they'll start talking about how they could never believe in a God who does this or they could never believe in a God who doesn't do that. And almost always I can respond by telling them, I don't believe in a God like that either. Let me tell you about the God that I preach on every Sunday. And then they begin to hear about Jesus. Then they begin to hear about who he really is, about what he has done, about what scripture teaches concerning him. And they're almost always amazed because they've never heard it that way before. They've never had the scriptures open to them. They've never been told truly who is Jesus. Because who do people say that Jesus is today? We'll get many different answers. That he's a great teacher, he's a moral example for us and our children, or that he's just a religious fantasy concocted by fanatics centuries ago. Or maybe even that he was a real person. But what we have is just ramblings of a desert crazy guy. And so after Jesus hears what other people are, are saying about him, of who he is, he turns the question then to the disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do you say Jesus is? That's an internally significant question that each of us has to answer. 
Is Jesus just your buddy or your pal? Is he just your advisor when things get rough in your life? Is it that you have Jesus, or do you have an imaginary friend that you try to rely on? Do you try to mold to your own ideas? To try to meet your needs and desires as you see fit? And then people say that Jesus comes to us as we are, that it doesn't really matter, because Jesus loves me anyway. Well, yes, Jesus does indeed come to you as you are, but he doesn't let you stay there. He doesn't let you stay tainted by sin. He doesn't let you remain wallowing in the filth of this world and satisfying the desires of your flesh. Because we have gods created in our own image, it's you who define what and who God is. At least that's what we think. And so Peter steps forward and answers the question, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. But did Peter know what that meant? He didn't, because in the text immediately following today's gospel lesson, Jesus predicts his death, and Peter rebukes him. So is it any wonder that at the end of today's text, Jesus strictly charges the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ, because he doesn't, they don't get it. And if you don't know and if you don't understand who Jesus is, then how can you preach about him? How can you tell others? People will say today, well, God spoke to my heart. He laid this on my heart. God doesn't speak to people that way. He speaks through the scriptures. That's how you can know who Jesus is. He doesn't come to you dwelling in flowers and trees. You don't see him in the smile of every baby or in warm, fuzzy feelings you get watching a sunset. Jesus is only known as the Christ as he is revealed to us in the word on the cross. And so when you have your eyes open to see the salvation of God in all of Scripture, from the people of Israel redeemed and saved from slavery in Egypt, to the return of the captives from Babylon, to the coming of Jesus in Bethlehem, answering the question of who Jesus is is a matter of life or death, of salvation or damnation. And that's why every parent who brings their child to the baptismal font is strictly charged to place into their child's hands the scriptures, the catechism, and to bring them to the services of God's holy house because they too will, will be then able to answer the question, who is Jesus? That he is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. That's what it means for Jesus to be the Christ, to be the anointed one, the Messiah, to suffer and die on your behalf, in your place. It's for this very thing that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism in the Jordan River to carry your sins from there to the cross and to pay for them with his blood, to proclaim the love of the Father to all people, to proclaim the love of the Father to you. That he sacrificed his one and only Son to save you. And that's what every father and mother is to teach their child. What each Christian, what each of you are strictly charged to tell others that they too would know who 
is Christ. That the Christ of the cross is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That he, that he is who comes each week under bread and wine, and at his presence we bow in deepest reverence. For he's not your buddy. He's not your pal. But he is your greatest friend who lays down his life for you to forgive you and to save you. And so Jesus tells us that on Peter and on his confession of who Jesus is, on the prophets and the apostles, Christ will build his church with himself as the cornerstone, Christ as the head. And now the church is strictly charged to use the gifts of God to take and eat, take and drink, to loose from sin those who repent and to bind those who do not, to baptize, to preach to all creation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, to care for one another in charity and love, for men to defend and provide for their family and to teach their children the catechism, for women to nurture and care for children, and for all of God's people, for you to tell people who is Jesus. It's not complicated like Dorian Gray, but it's wonderfully complex at the same time. And so this week, we start up catechesis again in our Wednesday evening worship. So this Wednesday, grab your catechism off the shelf. If you haven't used it for a while, dust it off and crack it open. If you can't find yours, come see me. I'll give you one for free. Join your brothers and sisters in Christ and delve into the teachings of Christ and Him crucified. For that's how you know and can answer who is Jesus. He is the Son of the living God. He is the crucified and risen one who takes away the sin of the world, who takes away all of your sin. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.